So good morning. Um, I've been looking at the concept of enmeshment since the early part of my career in the late 80s um, and early 90s. I worked at Children's Hospital in Detroit and we worked with a lot of kids who were school phobic. And the, it wasn't that the, they were afraid of school, it was that they were afraid of leaving their parent, typically their mother, who, who had leaned on the child so much the child felt obligated and loyal to the parent and absorbed her problems and was anxious upon separation. And, so, and sometimes that was a temperamental issue and, and other things, but oftentimes that was the dynamic we, we discovered. So uh, at that time, I was also being trained in uh, family systems therapy and family systems therapy looks at family functioning. And what they noticed is that families have uh, operate on a continuum of uh, closeness and um, on one end of the, of the continuum of, is what we call disengaged family systems. There's not a lot of emotional warm fuzzies going on. And that, that kind of family produces its own problems. On the other end of the spectrum is what we refer to as enmeshment, where there's a high degree of warmth, but there's a lack of boundaries that, between people and, and family members. And so people tend to merge with each other's problems creates a lot of anxiety, um, high levels of dependency, both good and, and sometimes uh, pathological in the sense that the adult then can't function by him or herself. So, you know, I took that base and uh, I wrote a couple books on the subject. The first was Silently Seduced, later when he's married to mom, and began to look at more specifically the relationship between the parent and the child, where the child felt obligated to take care of the parent at a cost to their own life and, uh, their, and their own autonomy and their own success, both romantically and um, financially and professionally, where their, their sense of being loyal to the system, the family system and the mother or father in particular, took up so much time and energy. And they felt so guilty about any movement away from that, that their natural urges of separation became a conflict. And so one of the ways I learned about that, I'm chuckling, but it's not funny, is, is the outpouring of uh, complaints from spouses who were thrown under the bus, so to speak, um, in, in their marriages to these enmeshed individuals. Well, for the sake of simplicity, we'll talk about the man enmeshed with his mother and the spouse, the woman who, I, I get I get multiple emails a week from women saying, you know, I can't I can't believe this. I wish I would have known about this before my marriage, but I've been second fiddle for the entirety of my marriage. He he talks to his mother or father, uh, makes decisions with them, but does not make decisions with me, uh, and then comes home and acts like a dependent child and expects me to take care of him. Um, so uh, a lot of this emerged from the, the, the reporting of the spouse who was involved. So I began looking at that and I want to walk you through a, p a few pieces of it. So oftentimes we get asked when we talk about enmeshment and you look at the subject of too much, too much intimacy. Can a family be too close? The short answer is yes. Um, there are some cultural normative issues that need to be taken in consideration, certainly the Orthodox community being one, uh, where, where, where the, this, the system is organized, in this case, around religion and, and community mores. Uh, we find that in other systems, the, the Asian community in, in the Western culture, they, they seem to, um, the, the system sort of comes together and there's a sense of obligation and loyalty to the system that's kind of inherent. So as you're talking about um, recovery from enmeshment, you have to be a little more nuanced and realize that sometimes this stuff can be treated as, uh, can be more normative and you have to be careful how you talk about it. Having said that though, I have seen a lot of dysfunction uh, in the second, third generations of enmeshed systems, even in normative system cultures say the orthodox community. So I, I often get asked, well, okay, uh, Dr. Adams, where's the line between caring for somebody and being a master over involved? Or, or where is the line between my cultural norms and, um, and enmeshment or being too over involved? And I, my answer is it's circular. So we could 
we could get 10 people in the room and we'd all have a different definition of what a line is and we would debate it for two hours and we still wouldn't come up with a, with a likely conclusion. So my, my answer is the following, is that there has to be emancipation and you have to get on the other side of the line in order to know when you're acting out of choice or when you're acting out of obligation. So there has to be an achieved identity. I'm living my life for myself first. Yes, I still love my family and community. And I heard Rabbi Russell say this to, uh, when we were talking about it, if you remember. And he said, first you have to de-emesh from the Orthodox community, then you have to re-emesh. <laughs> and I thought that was a, 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 an interesting way to say it. And he's right. You have to get on the other side of the line. This is my life and I want to be involved and I want to be in there, but I, I consult myself, I consult my spouse about where we're going on vacation, and then I talk to my parents, right? So I, I liked his answer, and I thought that was, was um, uh, a nice way to sum that up. <clears throat> so one, one of the family system therapists that I liked a lot when I was in uh, graduate school was a, a therapist by the name of Bodine. And he made some observations, which I thought was interesting. He says, family closeness seems connected with the perhaps it'd be more accurate to say enabled by easy access to distance. In other words, if I permit separation and autonomy as a parent, my adult child wants to return. If I cling and if I make love obligatory and conditional, they feel guilty, they feel angry, they're ambivalent, they really don't want to be around me, and we have a conflict. So closeness in families is enabled by easy access to distance. I really want to get your listeners' head around that. It's amazing. You know, I have a son who's in uh, 20 years old in college out of state. I'm in Michigan. He's in New York right now. And I, I'm practicing this letting go and, and giving, giving him space. And as he does, he, as I do, he slowly returns and wants to do things with his father and his mother, right? And But if I was to impose upon him guilty messages that you must obligate yourself to contact me, we'd have problems. So I think Bodine is right. Refraining from unnecessary coercion may be an expression of love. In the mesh systems, love is conditional. I love you, but you owe me which is trouble because it doesn't permit the child and the adult child to leave uh, the system and become their own man or their own woman. Uh, and then return to the system, return to the family, but as, a, as an emancipated adult, right? Versus I return to the family as a dependent guilty boy or a guilty girl. And then I take it out of my wife or my husband, my anger, my burden. So we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, so what are the characteristics? So if you go into the family systems literature, what are the characteristics of what the family system therapists say are um, the, the tenets of a healthy functioning family system? So just imagine, let's take it out of the community for a minute, but let's just look at the family system within the home, underneath the roof. How does it work? So here's what they observed. Those that functioned well, uh, which meant that, you know, there was enough love and connection and separateness and they were functional, right? He said the parents are, the, the parents are well differentiated. They're, they're their own man or own, their own woman too. There's a clear separation of generational boundaries. It doesn't mean that we aren't involved with our grandparents or our parents. It means that when it comes time to decide where I'm going on vacation, I consult with my spouse, not my parents. We have, and, and my kids get a vote um, and they have importance and there's a sense of generational boundaries. The loyalty is to the family of procreation. The family I create, the life I create is greater than the family of origin. Not equal to. Notice it doesn't say equal to. That's critical here. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Spouses put themselves before anybody else. My loyalty is to my partner, my husband, my wife, and I consult with her or him, and then I negotiate with my family. Versus the other way around, I negotiate with my family, I act out of guilt, 
okay, we're going on vacation with the whole family. Oh, by the way, honey, you got to come along and, and behave and not, not make any complaints, even though you don't want to go. The partner almost always gets thrown under the bus in these MS systems. It, encouragement of identity development and autonomy of each family member. You don't have to be the quarterback or the rabbi in the family. You can be an artist, a poet, a musician. Everybody gets equal esteem in these functional systems. Warmth and affection is non-possessive. You don't own me. It's not the way it works. You have children and, you know, um, those of your audience members who are familiar with Cahil Gibran, the um, Lebanese poet, he wrote <clears throat> on a number of subjects. One of them was children. Sometimes I show this poem. And he says, your children are not your children. Their life's longing for itself. So the obligation as a parent is to let them go, is to love them for the sake of loving them and to enjoy that loving, knowing one day you will have to make an adjustment and take the loss of your emerging adult child who also will return to the family and the community, but as an independent adult. <clears throat> Communication is clear and open. In other words, I don't tell your brother to call you to tell you to call me. Call your brother, tell him to call me, make him feel guilty, right? So in, in MS systems, there's always proxies, agents, that the parent uses to make others feel guilty. And it's open to outsiders. Of course, in some systems, like the, the Orthodox community, of course, and given the the religious tenants there, I mean, to some degree, of course, that's going to be a different version of that. <clears throat> I think what they mean here is that they're not the, the, the mother who is entangled with her son and doesn't want to let him go, doesn't express jealousy of the new woman he may be courting to marry. She's open to that outsider. So in that context, I think we can talk about that in the Orthodox community as well. So what are some of the characteristics in these MX systems? Strong demands for loyalty to the family, a shared reality of the system roles. <clears throat> it's imposed by those in charge. And it's, not, it's typically not the adult child, it's the parents. The demand is usually accompanied by messages of guilt and prohibition. Time together is maximized, little time or alone time or separateness is permitted and often seen as a betrayal. High degree of dependency. I can't function unless I call you five times a day. What do you think I should do? Right? So there's a, and to some degree, we all do that, right? We all borrow each other's brains and we, we have appropriate dependencies where we lean into people and what do you think I'm working on this decision? You know, I was just talking to my wife the other day about something that I'm sorting out. <clears throat> it is good to borrow people's brains. In these systems here, there's no independence. It's I can't even function unless you tell me what to do. And I have to, I have to call you all day and be reassured by you that I'm doing the right thing. So that kind of dependency is very disruptive to the emerging adult uh, competency because it feels neutralizing to the adult. I can't function by myself. I'm always going to be tethered to you, mommy and daddy. <clears throat> and then they, they in turn need you to be tethered so it sustains their own degree of emptiness or loneliness, almost always driving the enmeshment between parent and child. The parent is usually empty, lonely, struggling, maybe from their own family of origin, abuse, trauma, have anxiety problems, and uses the child as a love object to stabilize them. That's not the purpose of children. They aren't there to stabilize us. Sure, it feels good uh, to have good relationships with our children. There's nothing wrong with them. But children are not property. They're not, they're not meant to stabilize our adult needs. That's between us and our partner, us and our therapist, us and our friends, right? <clears throat> when, the, when it involves this parent and child dynamic, the child generally feels obligated to take care of the parent at their own cost. Almost always partner, spouses and partners feel second fiddle. These are the kind of problems we see. Again, overly bonded with the family of origin at a cost of their life. Ambivalent, can't make up their mind. Should I stay or should I go in this relationship? I don't even know what I want for dinner tonight. I can't figure out what, what I have. So when you, when, you, 
engulf a child. So that's what enmeshment does. Enmeshment isn't hitting somebody with a belt. That's a sort of physical form of abuse. Enmeshment is disrupting autonomy in, in, in the uh, unfolding of development by controlling, containing, and suffocating the spirit of the child at its worst moments. So I become ambivalent. I don't want to get too close to you. I don't know what I think. I don't know what I want because I'm supposed to want what my mommy wants or my daddy wants. So I have an ambivalence in me, a guilt and ambivalence. You saw my title of my talk was moving from guilt and ambivalence to passion and purpose, right? So that's the movement and enmeshment is I put my feet in the ground and say, this is where I'm going. Yes, I'll return, I'll love you, but I first have to put my feet in the ground. In enmeshment, I become very ambivalent. I don't know what I want. I don't know who I should be committed to. If you say you love me, that must mean I love you. So enmeshed adults often get into relationships they regret sometimes, they quick commit too quickly. We see excessive caretaking on the part of the enmeshed adult, lots of self-neglect, addictions. So addictions, particularly food and sex, you can control me, you can get in my way, but I'll eat what I want and I'll do what I want sexually, secretively. So addictions and from an enmesh, so enmeshment drives a rebellion. So addictions become a voice in the wilderness of I'm free. You can't control what the heck I eat or what I do sexually. I'll run off over here and be secretive and you can't get me, mommy or daddy. Or now I project it out to my wife or husband. Wife or husband, you can't have access to all of me. I'm gonna be secretive. I'll do what I want, I'll eat what I want. So process addictions, food, sex are common in enmeshed systems. And then sexually, I can also shut down, you know, where I, I sort of neuter myself. So my wife feels like my mother, I shut down sexually because now I've transferred my issues of my mother onto my wife. And now I want distance from both of them. I'll act out over here sexually in my porn, but over here I keep emotional distance and I become non-sexual. They, they report feeling guilty, disempowered. They displace their anger onto their partner and they have difficulty of bondage. Let me give you this little image. So here's, here's an image that comes from my book when he's married to mom. So the true self of the enmeshed, in this case, the man, the mother enmeshed man, true for women too, but let's just look at men for here. He, he's lost his sense of who he, what he thinks, who he feels. He's organized around others. So his false self is very accommodating, very charming, very giving, very loving, but inside he's, he's feeling trapped, angry, enraged, guilty because of this enmeshment with a mother or father or family. And then he does this. He transfers that to the partner, to the wife. Get away from me. You're too close. You want too much. You're too needy. So he takes out his anger and he rejects the wrong person. He should be separating here, not here. The wife, partner, husband always takes the loss. Let's quickly look at their experiences. Here's just, so these, these come up on my YouTube channel, Dr. Ken Adams. So they're public, so I, I can put them up here. Today, so this is just some of the partner's experiences and we'll end here. Today is our wedding anniversary and my husband's mother had just manufactured yet another drama, a poor me martyr type thing with the goal to lure my husband in. She wasn't at all happy to know we had several days together when we were happy. I was married for years to an enmeshed man, the father of our three children. He consulted his parents on major life decisions instead of me, and they would give him destructive advice out of jealousy. He would follow this scary advice half the time. He made me be the one to say I want a divorce. I get treated as though I'm his mother frequently. He doesn't even recognize it. My partner's in denial and he feels guilty whenever we travel somewhere and his parents aren't there to experience this. He rushes to make his mom feel better. How do I gently explain to a spouse that this is happening to him when he doesn't see it? And anytime I mention it, he becomes defensive and accuses me and I become the bad guy. I need therapy, she says. I don't know if I should stay with my husband and risk him never changing and leave my marriage and start my life over again. I get these comments every day on my email, every day. And so this is a problem. So you can 
somebody can claim, well, this is just what happens in my culture, but understand that there's a, there's a, the boulders rolling down the hill. Somebody is being victimized. Almost always it's the partner or spouse and the children to some degree as well. Here's finally, here's some, some experiences that partner feels unsure of their value. They feel overburdened with household parenting responsibilities and the enmeshed adult may feel like one of the children when they come home, take care of me, mommy. They may experience irritability and distance from the enmeshed adult after contact with the family. They are blamed, they may be gaslighted, they may be lied to. Uh, the enmeshed mothers may treat them with jealousy or the, or the enmeshed man or woman may go out of his way to keep, your mom, keep them apart. So these are just some of the highlights. I, I, can t I, I hope you can see in, in the discussion that, that the solution to the problem is working on boundaries, not, not amputation. So emancipation, becoming my own man and my own woman is not amputation, amputating the family. Let me be clear about that. Because that's what happens with MS systems when they begin to hear that there needs to be some separateness. What they hear is I have to amputate. Not true, not true. There has to be a reworking of the contract. How I need to be my own person and then I need borrowing Rabbi Russell, then I need to re mesh with you on my terms. I need to re re engage myself in the system, the community, but I also need to be my own man. So that and own woman and that that is the um, broad objective of recovering from a mesh. So silently seduced has has more about women in in when he's married to mom we focused on uh, men and and their mothers. Uh, there is a section in there for the spouse about what sh should I stay or should I go. Um, so so yes it's true that women often are enmeshed in equal numbers with their mothers and to some degree their fathers, but women culturally are more reinforced to take care of their parents. So they don't often feel quite as at odds with the involvement and the obligations that a man might. Uh, so, so, so the men report, they're quicker to feel conflicted, angry and guilty. The women can, but they have to get past that sort of cultural identity formation. I have to take care of my parents. So, and, and what we see is typically uh, the woman, the spouse is pushing the man into treatment. So that's why we see more men. Whereas men are typically not put, pushing their enmeshed wife into treatment. He's saying, fine, you go take care of your parents. I'm going to go off, do my golf game. I'm going to go off and drink. I'm going to do, do whatever I want to do. Uh, I might have actually like the fact that you're not available. I get to be apart from you. Um, so we don't have as many men saying to the wives, you gotta, you gotta do this. I don't want to be in, I don't want a three person marriage here. So that's one of the reasons. Um, the other thing that we see, uh, although we are seeing more women coming into our workshops, for example, um, and there's a lot, and they report the same thing, loss of identity, uh, eating, eating problems, eating disorders, sexual acting, uh, sexual addictions, uh, feeling trapped and guilty, not having time for their spouse uh, and or even their kids, that the, that the parent becomes so primary that they wind up neglecting their own children. And then their children are acting up at home and they wonder why. It's because they're, they've left their own family of procreation and given loyalty to the mother. So we do see that with women. Uh, and with women, we see uh, mommy's best friend, mommy's surrogate, uh, companion because dad is lonely, dad is absent. Sometimes though we see women with men where she's become the sexualized girlfriend. Daddy has had a, not physically an inappropriate relationship, but sees her as his special girl. She raises her that way. So we see that as well. <clears throat> Uh, 
Well, so I, you know, I have a biased sample, right? Because I've written the book, When He's Married to Mom, I see a lot of men enmeshed with their mothers. But we just had a man last week in the workshop who was enmeshed with his father. And the father was the one directing the, the enmeshment and the demand for loyalty. Um, and when that happens, we tend to see a little more narcissism in the father where the child becomes an extension of what I need and demand from you. I need you to be a certain way for me. So that, that enmeshment is this narcissistic demanding link that we see. Oftentimes, though, it's both parents. So even when, for example, the mother is the main protagonist with enmeshing her son or daughter, the father will often call. We get this all the time. Call the son, daughter, and say, call your mother. She needs you. So, so you, they work, that, Would that they be work. called the enabler, maybe? Yeah, you could say that they work as a team because he his function, though, is I don't want to deal with her. You deal with her. So he's the other bookend in supporting this enmeshment. He gets a payoff. He doesn't have to put up with the he doesn't have to reconcile with his wife, his own marital discord. So we get a lot of reporting of that kind of thing. Um, but we do you know, there's a. You know, again, so we have women coming into the enmeshment workshop and probably I'm just armchairing this. Um, probably half and half of the women report with father, the other half report with mother, the men coming in the largest portion report with mother with the father being part of the proxy or agent in helping in that. We, we did an experiential technique where we use the concept, uh, the circles of intimacy, um, responsibility and impact, which comes from a clinician by the name of Marilyn Murray, who uh, wrote a book uh, called The Murray Method. Um, and this is her concept. And I believe it's in the book, um, but don't quote me there. And so what she said was that if you can imagine a set of concentric circles, right? And um, in the inner circle is, and she said, the closer somebody is to your inner circle, where you're supposed to be residing, your core self, uh, is, the con is the idea that you have more responsibility to them and them to you, and also that they can cause more pain or harm, I mean, pain or joy, as well as you to them and them to you, the closer somebody is to your circle. So you have to, you have to be careful who you place where. And so what she said, and then and the more intimacy was available to you, the closer somebody is to your circle. So what she said was the inner circle, the very core circle around these concentric circles, was supposed to be you, you and God, nobody else, not your mother, not your father, not your kids, not your spouse. In a lot of these MS systems, the mother or father have played the role of God, and they're they're in they're in that inner circle and they don't belong, and or. The second circle is meant for your romantic partner and your young kids, not your mother, not your father, not your porn, not your eating disorder, right? And you in the, the recovery for the enmeshed man or woman is to learn to shuttle from my core self, my godly core self, soulful self, I'm going to move over and join my partner, my wife or husband and my kids, but I also learned to shuttle and have my own separateness, even from my family. And notice that the parents are not in these two circles. Circle three is meant to be people who are close to you, but have your best interest in mind. So you don't want somebody in circle three who feels entitled to intrude into circle two. So oftentimes the parents and sometimes the brothers and sisters have taken camp in circle three and two, the marital bond and they're close on the outside. And not all of them have your best interest in mind. So that's the hardest rearranging to do is where do I place these family members? And so experientially, feeling wise, what we did in that exercise uh, when I visited is we had one of the men who's, I believe it was his father, who had taken up residency in his God center, and the father was the God, 
and by definition trespassed on all the other ones. We had him actually physically move. We had circles on the ground done in chalk. We had him actually physically move somebody playing his father outside those intimate circles and put him where he belonged, circle four. You can't be my God. You can't interfere in my marriage. I love you, but I'm not letting you get so close to me that you take up residency anymore. So that was a powerful moment for him, we both remember. And I hope that he took it, which doesn't mean you go home and you grab your parent by the collar, shirt collar and confront them. That's not what this means, right? It's an internal shift of how I feel about the placement of these people. So that's a concentric circle exercise. It's a powerful, <clears throat> it's a powerful exercise to do in your therapy and your group therapy at, at Fresh Start in a, in a process like Fresh Start, where you actually place the circles on the ground and you have each member rearrange the, the chairs on the, on the deck of the, of the ship. Right? No, mommy, you can't be in circle two with me and my wife. You've got to be out in three or four here. Four here. I'll come visit. I love you, but you're not getting in. Right? So it's an internal shift. How you say it and how you deliver it to the parent, that's a different discussion. I think the, so... I think the hardest thing to do is to let go of your children. It's, it's the last parenting assignment. I often refer to it, and maybe I'm, I'm speaking on a term, but I'll say it anyways. I think it's the last spiritual assignment for a parent is to take the loss of their adult child, child moving into the world. So I would say to those parents, you know, you've done your job. Let your child take your lessons and move into the world with them and become their own person and celebrate the love that you had for them. Don't hang on. Provide the freedom that they need to become their own person and then want to visit with you. Want to spend holidays with you. Drop the guilt. Drop the obligation as difficult as it is. It doesn't serve anybody. It is your job. It's your spiritual assignment. And they're, they're not obligated. So obligatory love by itself is, I would say, is not pathological. I, I would like my son to visit with me. And sometimes he and I might have a difficult conversation where I, I, I say to him, look, you're not being very sensitive to mom and dad. You know, we've got to talk about this. But I'm still getting out of his way. The more I get out of his way, the more he wants to return to visit. So love is not meant to be a currency of guilty obligation. This, the, the journey of the parent is to prepare the child to the world. I would turn them over to Gibran's poem. Your children are not your children. Their life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. They belong not to you. That's the first part of this poem I'm quoting. And so it's sad. It, so, so I would say you need to grieve. You know, I, when my son left for college, and <laughs> I had my moments, my wife did. Um, so, um, you know, and I talked to parents and they all talk about how the difficulty with grieving, turn to each other, turn to your spouse, and then emancipate yourself from your child. Be, get, get yourself a hobby, pick up an instrument, write your book, do your thing, exercise, have good nutrition, find your own life outside of just being a parent, which has been, you know, it's, I've, I've watched, I've, I finished the book that I've been sitting on for years, in these last couple of years. Um, and that was partly because I had to recommit to my own life outside of my parenting. I love being a parent. Uh, most people do, but there's a, there's a um, time limit on, on the type of parenting that we all like, where we feel needed and valued by our little boy or little girl. Um, it's time to reconstruct the contract, mothers and fathers. It's sort of almost peer-like, right? Uh, and support maybe with the grandchildren based on 
based on their parents value system or how they want their family so the sometimes the enmeshing grandparents will impose their selves onto the grandchildren and create conflict so they have to also be mindful of that so they become more reconciled to a loving supportive consulting role and the truth is it's the child moves into the world more and more <clears throat> so we're bonded by memory we're bonded by love we're bonded by the visitation that occurs over the Sabbath or the holidays. And we like those rituals, but sometimes people can't make it. And we give, we give ourselves loving, we take a deep breath and say, okay, I'll look forward to seeing you next time. Rather than, what do you mean you're not coming? You better make arrangements, right? That's, that's, that's not the route that allows this reconstruction of the contract between adult child and parent. And to come back to Bodhi, right? Permission to be separate breeds closeness. So we'll end there. I think that's the message I'd send to your, to your parents. Your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls. For their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you. For life goes not backward, nor tarries with yesterday. You are the bows from which your children as living arrows are sent forth. The archer sees the mark upon the path of the infinite, and he bends you with his might, that his arrows may go swift and far. Let your bending in the archer's hand be for gladness. For even as he loves the arrow that flies, so he loves also the bow that is stable.